Welcome to um, the second lecture of this uh, process mining course. Um, today, um, we are going to be uh, entering a bit more into the topic of uh, performance measurement and dashboards, which we kind of briefly mentioned last week. <clears throat> I'm going to elaborate on that. With respect to the entire course I'll outline, we are basically um, a, at the start, we're going to look today into uh, how to measure the performance of a process in a more systematic way of attaching performance measures to a process along different dimensions. And then we're going to see how can you, you know, take those performance measures and turn them into visualizations and beyond that dashboards that can help uh, process managers, managers of these processes or analysts to kind of make sense of the process and determine in what direction it should be improved. A, it's, this is a prerequisite for moving into the topic of process mining per se, where process mining is a bit, as we will see, a bit of a, 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 a way of looking at the process deeper than what you would do if you only used dashboards. We, uh, we saw last week um, that uh, a, a business process um, a, can be improved in different directions. Um, if you had to choose between two business processes, you kind of naturally tend to select the business process that is the faster, the cheaper, and the better. Uh, so those are, from a customer perspective at least, those are the three main properties that you look in a business process. Um, and uh, there, that, that leads us to think about the performance of a process in terms of three dimensions, at least. Uh, the time dimension, you know, that deals with effectively, does the process get executed and completes uh, within a time frame that allows you, that fulfills your needs as a user, as a customer of the process. Um, the cost perspective, which is more of an internal perspective and reflects how much it costs for our organization to deliver this process uh, to its customers. And of course, this is something we'll try to minimize. And the quality perspective, you know, which reflects um, how satisfied uh, or delighted uh, the customers are with the outcomes that the process uh, provides to them. So we're going to be going through each of these three dimensions, and I'm going to introduce some concepts, some vocabulary um, that will help you to find suitable names for performance measures that you will need to deal with uh, when you start analyzing a business process. Let me start with time measures. Arguably, the mother of all performance measures from a temporal perspective in the field of business process management is what sometimes people call cycle time. Some other people also call it lead time, and other people call it throughput time. So you will find when you walk into different organizations, slightly different terms for it, but it means the same thing, and it is very simple. It's the time it takes between the moment I start um, a, 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 a purchase or, uh, between the moment, sorry, the time it takes between the moment an instance of the process starts and the moment it completes. Let me take, for example, an order to cash process. That process starts when a customer sends me a purchase order and it finishes when I have completed the delivery and the customer has paid me the invoice. For every execution of the process, I can retrieve from my information systems, for example, my ERP system, you know, the timings when I receive the order and the timing when the payment for the corresponding invoice is, is received and the invoice is marked as paid. Hence, for every instance of the process, I can retrieve what is its cycle. 
Uh, and, and I can then, if I look at all the executions of this process that happened in the year 2020, I could tell you what is the average cycle time of this process, or I can tell you what is the median cycle time of this process, or the maximum, or the minimum, or the 90th percentile of the cycle time of this process. And these are aggregate measures that give me a good idea of how my customers will perceive the performance of my process. Um, naturally, the concept of cycle time depends on what is the scope of your process. When do you consider that an instance of the process starts? And when do you consider it as done? So I can take that same process and say, look, look, Marlon, I'm not really interested in knowing what is the time between the moment you uh, receive the order and the moment you get paid. As a cust our customer is probably much more interested in the time between I receive an order and the moment that the corresponding products are delivered to my customer's site. So, so I, I, that's kind of more interesting. So instead of talking about the cycle time of the entire order to cash process, I might actually be interested only in the cycle time of the order to delivery sub process of this longer process. And separately, I can keep track of the time between the invoice, I, the moment I send an invoice and the moment I get paid. That's not very interesting for my customer, but it's definitely interesting to me uh, because that determines how fast I receive the payment for the products that I have delivered. So you have to contextualize cycle time. You have to be very clear about which cycle time are you talking about? Are you talking about the cycle time of an entire end-to-end -end process? Are you talking about the cycle time of a sub-process or even a fragment in the process. But nevertheless, regardless of how you choose to scope your process, you will always be able to define the concept of cycle time of that process. Now, cycle time, which, as I said, is like the main reference. It's like when we talk about time, we usually refer about cycle time. But cycle time can be declined or can be refined or decomposed rather into some other temporal measures. Two of them that are very important is the processing time and the waiting time. The waiting time is also called idle time, I-D-L-E. Since I have Blackboard today, I'll be putting these synonyms here. Waiting time. Sometimes it's also called uh, an idle time. And the uh, cycle time is sometimes also called lead time or sometimes called throughput time. by different communities. There are different like sub-disciplines in the field of business process management that will use kind of a slightly different terminology. So, um, as I was saying, the cycle time of the process includes two components, the processing time and the waiting time. The processing time is the time we spend actually doing work. For example, let me take an, an order to cash process to say something. We receive a purchase order and we might receive that purchase order at uh, eight o'clock in the morning and we're very, very busy because last night we received a lot of purchase orders. So we put that one on hold and only at around 11 a.m. we pick it up and we start working on it. Then we work on it for like half an hour. We, 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 uh, we, we schedule the delivery, the packing, everything of that order. We respond to the customer. Then later around 4 p.m., the packaging of the products occurs. 
and somewhere around 6 p.m., it's loaded into a truck and it leaves for Latvia, you know. So we dispatch it. Um, the, the order to shipment cycle time was about 10 hours between it arrived at 8 a.m. and we dispatch it at 6 p.m. So that's the cycle time of order to shipment. So uh, about 10 hours. But during those 10 hours, we did not continuously work on this purchase order. It's not like our, our employees were just working on that purchase order. They actually only work about on it half an hour in the morning, maybe half an hour packaging the products in the afternoon, and maybe 10 minutes loading them into a truck. So in total, we only worked 30 plus 30 plus 10, 70 minutes on this purchase order. But it took us um, a 10 hours to complete it. So the cycle time is 10 hours, but the processing time is only 10 minutes. What happens? What is the rest of the time? The rest of the time, this order was idle. It was waiting. Uh, and that is what we call the waiting time. So 10 hours minus 70 minutes, which is 8 hours and 50 minutes, that is the waiting time for that order. And, a, and, uh, and processing time and waiting time are going to be measures that are going to keep coming and coming and coming because they tell us a lot about the cost of the process. The cost of the process is quite proportional to the processing time, at least the labor cost of the process. And it also tells us a lot about the efficiency of our process. You know. We say that we are very inefficient, that we mean time inefficient, when we have a very high proportion of waiting time. And to capture this intuition, in the field of business process management or performance measurement, we, we tend to use another performance metric called the cycle time efficiency of a process. The cycle time efficiency is simply the processing time taken on average, for example, divided by the cycle time, will be the average cycle time. So in this business process I mentioned to you, imagine that on average, I spend 60 minutes working in one order, roughly what my workers spend on it. And the cycle time on average, let's say, is 10 hours. So the cycle time is 10 hours, the processing time is one hour, Hence, the waiting time is nine hours. My cycle time efficiency is processing time, one hour, divided by cycle time, 10 hours. So one divided by 10 is 10%. So 10% is considered to be pretty standard cycle time efficiency, particularly for processes that involve um, actual physical movement or processes um, a, a, that a require certain amount of people to go and do some diagnosis and to resolve issues, etc. A 10% cycle time efficiency is pretty good. In some cases, you will encounter situations where the cycle time efficiency is much lower. Take, for example, when you go to ask for um, a, a passport at a passport office. Um, you go and you, you fill in some form and you take a picture and you attach it and you present yourself and they you know, see that you are you, um, check your old passport or your other documents and they say it's all fine. And then they put it on the back burner and for a long time nothing happens and then somebody sort of some checks and then in the next batch, somebody like schedules the printing of your passport and prints it and ships it. You will find that in that process, maybe 10 days pass between the moment you made your passport request, that's the application, and the moment the passport was shipped to you. Yet, people only work in this process maybe for an hour, maybe two maximum. So the cycle time efficiency of this process will be two hours divided by whatever you call 10 days, um, and, and that will be pretty low. Um, by the way, 
That brings me to the topic of what do I do when I have differences in granularity? Um, like I talked about processing time in the order of hours, and I talked about cycle time in the order of days. Of course, there are many ways of doing this conversion. It is a standard practice in the field of EPM to do the conversion in terms of working hours, however. So if you say that we work eight hours per day, um, only during weekdays, then you will say that uh, when you calculate cycle time, you will take that into account and you will say like, okay, 10 days, that was, let's say on average, only seven or eight working days, every working days have eight hours. So I'll be talking about like, the cycle time of this process is 64 working hours, eight working days times eight hours per day. So be careful when you do conversions between uh, different time granularities for the purpose of computing performance measure for business processes. Kind of be mindful that it kind of makes more sense if you do the conversion, uh, taking into account the, the duration of the work, because there's very little you can do about uh, holidays or weekends, etc. It's not something you can really improve. So that's what I wanted to say about uh, temporal measures of performance for business processes. Cycle time of a given process or process fragment, the main measure we will be manipulating, decompose into processing time and waiting time. And if you divide processing time divided by cycle time, you get the cycle time efficiency. That's a very important measure we're going to try to be improving. Modern digital native companies are kind of have pushed the boundaries of the cycle time efficiency. Whereas traditionally you would say, I'm very happy when my cycle time efficiency is 10%. You know, these modern uh, a, a digital native companies are pushing that cycle time efficiency to um, say a, only 50% or 60% or 70%. Like for example, I order now and my stuff is delivered in two hours. Or I order now and my thing is delivered in less than an hour. So, so the, and, and, and all that time that was spent is like people actually doing work, people packaging, people transporting, etc. So that, that's where digital native companies are pushing the boundaries of cycle time efficiency in modern customer-oriented business processes. Then, in addition to time, we have to also keep an eye on our cost measures. And the way we can think about cost in a business process is kind of very similar to time. We can make a bit of a parallel between the two. You can, we will, in business process management or business process performance measurement, when we want to measure cost, we will try to bring them to the per instance level. Because every instance of the cost of the process is serving a need of a customer. And what we want is to make sure that we efficiently fulfill that need. So we will be manipulating a, um, a performance measure for cost called the per instance cost or the cost per instance, which we will sometimes just call the cost. And this cost per instance is how much it costs me as a company to run one execution of the process. For example, how much it costs me to run one purchase order through my system. And that per instance cost can also be divided into two parts, the processing cost and the other side is called the cost of waste. So what I do to do that is that I identify among the the, the activities that I perform in my process, which ones are necessary for the customers and which ones are not necessary. And then I measure how much it costs me to do the activities that are necessary and how much it costs me to do the activities that are not necessary. For example, as far as the customer is concerned, the fact that I have to move a product from one side of my warehouse to the other warehouse next door before being able to ship to them, that's not adding value to them. So I will call that waste. 
And I'll call the activity where I move my product from one to the other, I call it waste. The cost of doing those movements, I'm going to count them as a cost of waste. The cost of actually replying to the customer, telling them when we will deliver their order, packaging their order and putting it into a truck, that part we're going to call it processing cost. And we're going to try to measure these two separately. Note that there is a bit of a symmetry between processing cost and processing time. So it's like what I need to do and waiting time and cost of waste, which is the stuff that I want to get rid of, that the customer is not paying me to do. So the two together, if you add them, that gives you the per instance cost. And you could define a ratio measure of efficiency if you wanted, which will be the uh, processing time efficiency, which will be processing cost efficiency, which is how much you, what part of the cost is actually needed divided by the total cost. That, of course, is something you will want to be 100%. You will ideally want that every movement you are doing, every task you are doing is necessary to serve your customer. Be careful with cost measures um, because in a cost, there are two components to it. At least there are actually more, but at least two components, two direct components, the material cost and the resource cost. So let me take this order to cash process as that I said before. And let me assume that I am at a company that sells um, electric equipment, like appliances, like uh, fridges, um, smart TVs, um, uh, vacuum cleaners or vacuum cleaning robots, etc. So when I order something, let's say at their web store, click, 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 and I order, um, the, um, the cost of serving me has actually two components. There is the material cost, which is like how much this smart TV I just bought costs to the supplier, to, to them, to, the, to the, the seller. And then there is how much it costs them to, to get in my order, to pack that item, uh, to put it in, uh, to give it to the logistic, to the transportation provider and to bring it to my home. Plus all the costs that it takes them to handle my customer complaints afterwards and handle product returns, etc. So, so these are two different things: the material cost, the cost of the, 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 the stuff that is being served, and the resource cost. Typically, we want to separate them, and when we do business process optimization, we, we want to usually focus on the resource cost and try to eliminate the material cost of it. Not that it's not important to reduce material cost, but that is a separate matter. You know, it's not, it's not really part of this process. It's something you will try to optimize in your supply chain processes or in your supply chain management processes instead of optimizing it as part of your business process improvement efforts. So typically in this course, when I will tell you um, a cost, I am referring to the cost of the resources, human resources particularly, that are used to deliver a product, and not to the cost of the materials that compose that product itself, just because the resource cost is the part that we will be trying to optimize. When it comes to optimizing resources, so I try to optimize um, in essence, um, how, what percentage of my time, uh, of their time, my resources, my workers are spending doing actual work. So one additional performance metric that I'll be talking about a lot is the so-called resource utilization, which is the time that a resource spends conducting work in the process divided by the total available time. Every resource will have some idle time, some time where they are waiting for work. They are waiting for something to come um, or time that they are spending doing something else uh, than the process itself. 
And I'm going to try to look at my data and look at the ratio of how much time the worker actually spent doing activities in the processes in which they could, to which they contribute, divided by their available time. And I'm going to try to maximize that because if I maximize that, I will be grid. It's, it's a way of improving my efficiency. I will overall be reducing my resource cost by maximize resource utilization. If my resources are working, let's say, at 80% capacity, then I am actually, as a result, reducing the cost per instance, the resource cost per instance of my process. However, there is a trick to it. When you try to increase resource utilization to become more efficient, you know, you want to use your risk that 80% of your time, your resources are working. Of course, of their available time, I'm not talking about their total time, but their available time, the time they have to work. If I try to push that beyond 80%, what is going to happen is that my waiting times, the waiting times of my process are going to increase um, because I'll be creating queues. Why? Let's say that by the team in my warehouse that does all the packaging of products to send to my customers is working at 90% capacity. And let me assume that, you know what, it's Monday and we receive quite a lot of orders during the weekend. So we have a big pile of work to do and we have people who are already working at 90% capacity, even without that pile of work. What's going to happen? All these orders are going to be queuing up, waiting to be packaged but my resources are too busy and they probably won't package them on Monday. They will leave them to Tuesday or even to Wednesday. Uh, so if I push my resource utilization too high, then cases get delayed and my waiting times increase. And, and, and we're going to be, a lot of what we do in process improvement is about managing this trade-off between the resource utilization on the one hand and the waiting time on the other hand. Uh, another, the third dimension of performance that I introduced you at the start of this lecture was quality. So time, cost, and quality. And in quality, there are really different ways of measuring it. Ultimately, the mother of all quality measures is customer satisfaction. It's like the customer of the process will give you a high feedback score if they have the chance to do it. So that's why you see, in, particularly in digital native companies, you know, at the end of every transaction with them, they will put you like, how was our service? And you have to select between one and five stars, right? And if you select like three stars, they will ask you, can you give us some feedback? Uh, because of course, they are trying to maximize their customer score and, uh, and that ensures that you will remain a loyal customer and that they will have like sustained value to generate. Um, there is a similar metric that companies use a lot. It's called the net promoter score, which is roughly the difference between the customers who will recommend you to their friends and minus the customers who will emit a negative recommendation for you. Uh, and you want your net promoter score to be positive. You want that you know, people are recommending you to others because that will bring you more business. Uh, customer's feedback score, also called customer satisfaction score, and net promoter score are just two measures of quality. They are called external quality measures because they come from outside your process. They come from your customers. You cannot directly improve them. You cannot go and put a gun on your customer and say, hey, please give me five out of five. And that would be completely counterproductive to do such a thing. But you can influence your customer satisfaction indirectly by just doing your job better. And doing your job better, that's called internal quality. And there are in business processes at least two types of internal quality measures we try to manipulate. The first one is called the defect rate. Um, defect rate is defined as follows. First, I, 
define a notion of a defect in my process. Uh, for example, if I have an order to cash process in an online sh shop that sells electronic appliances or electric appliances like domestic appliances, when the customer, when I send the wrong product to the customer, like the customer asked me for a washing machine of type A and I send a washing machine of another type and the customer returns it to me, that's called a defect. There are orders where I will have a defect of that type and orders where I will not have a defect. And the percentage of orders that have a defect divided by the total number of orders, that's what we call the defect rate. And we can define defect rate for different types of defects. I just mentioned one type of defect, delivering the wrong product. But there could be another type of defect. For example, um, it might be that we deliver to the wrong address. So wrong address is another type of defect. You know, we deliver to two neighbors next door and not to you, and you call us what's going on with my washing machine. So that's another type of defect, which I can call a delivery defect, right? And I can define multiple defects in your process. Every negative outcome in your process is in a way a defect. And for each negative outcome in your process, for each type of negative outcome, you can define a defect measure. And these different defect measures helps you to measure the quality of your process. So I cannot influence directly, I cannot change directly my customer satisfaction score, but I can try to reduce my defect rates. And as a result, in future, my customers should be more satisfied. That's what the theory tells you. Another type of quality measures that I will be talking about a lot in this lecture are delivery quality measures. And in there, we will be very interested in particularly in a measure called on-time delivery rate, which means that for every process, I scope it and I define what we call a service level agreement or SLA. Let's say the SLA might be four days. I promise you as a customer that you will receive your order in four days, four working days to say something. So I then count how many times I deliver before four days versus how many times divided by the total number of orders. And that's called an on-time delivery rate. See, my on-time delivery rate is 90%. It means that I'm delivering within the time bounds to 90% of my customers. In addition to on-time delivery rate, which intuitively you know that's something that I should do, that I should keep as high as possible, another complementary measure that is very often used in process performance measure is that the variance of the cycle time. So you take the cycle time and you calculate this number called the variance and you can find out on Wikipedia what, how to calculate a variance. So you calculate the variance if the, if the, the, if it's standard, if, if the, if the distribution of delivery of the cycle time follows a normal distribution, you will typically use something called the standard deviation to characterize the variance. And you want the standard deviation to be as low as possible. Why? Let me give you an example. Um, imagine that the passport office of Estonia says that your passport will be delivered within 10 working days of the request. But sometimes they deliver it in two working days or three working days. And sometimes they deliver it in 12 working days. That's not good. That's going to create a bad perception of quality. Why? Because imagine two, last month, your neighbor asked you for a passport and they received it in two days. And this time you asked him for a passport and it's been five working days and you haven't received it. What are you going to do? You're going to say, what's, ask, what's happening? You will call them, you will ask, you know, are you sure you got my, my, my passport application, etc. So, so the fact that you deliver to your neighbor 
that the company that the passport was delivered to an airport in two days creates an expectation. And then the other customers will want you to meet that expectation somehow. Um, so it's kind of good measure of quality to say, well, I'm going to deliver within four, 10 days. And these 10 days is going to be such that I'm going to always be at eight days plus minus one. If you do it that way, you are predictable. The more you are predictable, the less you will create surprises with your customer, bad surprises, and the more your customer will say, well, this service works very well. You know, not only they deliver within a reasonable time frame, but you can be sure when you will get it. Uh, so on-time delivery rate, cycle time variance, and defect rate are going to be three of the quality measures we're going to keep an eye when we try to improve business processes, particularly using process mining. So I've talked about three dimensions of performance, time, quality, and, um, and cost. These are the main dimensions. These are the dimensions that really matter ultimately to the customer. You know, time matters to your customer, quality matters to your customer, and also um, cost matters to your customer. It matters to you as a company, of course, but it also determines what are the prices that you offer to your customer. And therefore, it also matters for your customer. There are some other internal measures that are also going to be useful because they have a relation with these uh, uh, other measures that we have introduced before. Two of them that we're going to be manipulating in this course are the case arrival rate and the work in process. The case arrival rate is a measure of how much demand there is for my process. It is defined as the number of new cases that are created per time unit. So you have to take a time unit, say the day, or it could be the hour, and you have to say how many cases on average, for example, arrive per hour. Let's imagine that um, we're talking here about a company that sells electronic appliances online, and let's say during, you know, on average, they receive, say, 10 orders per hour. So their case arrival rate for their order to cash process is 10 cases per hour. And that we're going to be calling it lambda. So it's going to be written, this is the Greek letter, lambda. When I talk about lambda, I'm talking about that case arrival rate. Beware, um, sometimes instead of talking about case arrival rate, um, we are going to be talking about the inter-case arrival time, meaning the time between two arrivals. And there is a direct relation between them. If my arrival rate is 10 orders per hour, it means that on average, I receive an order every six minutes. Of oh, six minutes, six minutes, six minutes, six minutes, six minutes. On average, that makes 10 per hour. So sometimes I'm not going to be talking about lambda. I'm going to be talking about the inverse of lambda, which is one divided by lambda, which is also known as the uh, intercase arrival time or interarrival time for short. So that's for lambda, case arrival rate. It's a measure of how much demand there is in your process. If I say you have 10 orders per hour, that might be for you low demand. Around Christmas time, you might receive 50 orders per hour. That is a high demand for your process. Irrespective or of your demand, um, you also have a certain workload. Um, and the workload that you currently have, which might be current workload or backlog, is, the, is measured by means of a measure called the WIP. So W-I-P. And I'll be talking a lot about WIP, and it doesn't mean that I am whipping you. Um, WIP means, or work in process, means the number of cases that are active at a particular point in time. If I say, for example, that this online shop 
has in their order to cash process, or in, let's put it in their order to delivery process, they have a week of 100, it means that they are currently, if you look at their system, there are currently 100 orders that have been started, that I have received, and that I have not yet delivered. So I am working on 100 orders. If you are working, for example, in an IT help desk process where customer put complaints and you resolve them, um, you're going to find that a, this uh, a process is a, um, receives, for example, 50 requests per, per hour. And let's say there are 20 people in the help desk working through them. And at some point in time, if you go and check, they have about 150 um, requests open. Uh, for example, uh, yeah. Now, there is a very strong relation, and that the reason why I introduced these two measures, lambda, or case arrival rate, and working process, is that there is a, a fundamental relation between WIP, which is the working process, lambda, the case arrival date, and cycle time. And as I said, cycle time is a very important measure. So the cycle, the, the relation with these two, these two measures is called Little's law after the, the discoverer or the inventor of this, this measure, of this uh, relation. Um, and it tells you that the WIP is equal to the case arrival rate, lambda, multiplied by the cycle time. So, for example, if I have in my process, if my WIP is equal to, a, sorry, if my if I have 10 customers per hour, which is lambda is equal to 10, and it takes me two hours per claim, which means the cycle time of a claim is two hours, little law tells me how many claims will I have open at a given point in time. And that will be lambda 10 multiplied by two, which is equal to 20 claims. At any point in time, on average, you'll find 20 claims open in this process. Using Little's law in this direction is not very interesting, but it's actually more interesting uh, sometimes when you use it in another direction. Say that um, you want to, you have, for example, the, uh, you want to know uh, the cycle time of the process, and you don't have a way of measuring directly. You cannot really see exactly, for example, in a restaurant when, when someone enters and where someone exits, it's kind of a bit to correlate these events. So you, it's kind of difficult to know what is the cycle time. But interestingly, it's very easy to know how many customers enter the restaurant per hour. You just put a machine that beeps every time somebody enters, opens the door and enters, and it triggers a counter. And then imagine that that tells you that on average, 50 people enter into your restaurant per hour um, after making a lot of measurements. And now let me imagine that um, about that, I then have a video camera that is, that is videoing what is happening in the restaurant, and I can get someone to then go and take some random snapshots of this video stream and to count how many people there were inside. Uh, and let's say that uh, they find that on average, the working process, which is the, the number of people that are in the restaurant that are being served, is about um, a 200. So then I now know how to calculate the cycle time, which was so elusive to find, the cycle time, meaning the time that a customer spends in my restaurant, is now equal according to Little's law. We is equal to lambda times CP. Therefore, CP is equal to we 
divided by lambda, which in this case will be 200 divided by 50. Maybe I exaggerated, maybe this was 100 instead of 200, let me make it 100. And then that tells me that my patrons spend on average two hours inside my restaurant, which I might find to be a little bit too high, and I might want to bring down. And what does Little's law tells me about that? It tells me that, for example, if my restaurant has a capacity of 100, and because of coronavirus, I have to bring it to 50, so my whip has to go down to 50, what, how can I achieve that? So Little's law tells us that if you want to bring width down, you either have to bring lambda down, so admit less customers per hour, or you have to bring cycle time down, which means you have to find a way that people stay for less time. And, and using width, little slow, you can reason a little bit about these relations by how much would you need to decrease cycle time or would the demand need to be decreased so that you keep your whip within a certain uh, a time frame. We'll do some exercises about that in the practice session to reinforce this relation. Right, so I have introduced like the main types of performance measures that you will typically find. Uh, time measures, uh, cost measures, and uh, quality measures. And even some additional measures of demand and uh, and workload with that are related to temporal measures. Now, how do you, I have a process, and as a process manager, I want to figure out what performance measures should I care about in my process? Surely, I can define lots of performance measures with the concept that I just introduced. I can define lots of type of defect rates. I can define different types of a on time delivery rates, cycle times, processing times, waiting times, resource utilization, etc. And I have not even finished introducing all the possible performance measures that you could define. How do I know which measures I should care about? The general method for doing that is a bit of a top down method. You start by figuring out at this moment what does the organization care about? What does the organization need to improve? Managers, especially in the executive team, every year or sometimes even every three months or six months, conduct an exercise called the balanced scorecard, which is that they define like the objective of the organization for the year 2021, where they want to be at the end of 2021, and they then decompose that objective into a number of so-called KPIs or key performance indicators. And then these KPIs get defined along four dimensions. And that's what the balance scorecard gives you. It's like a vocabulary to talk about performance measures at the organizational level. They get divided into financial measures or financial KPIs customer KPIs, internal process KPIs, and innovation and learning KPIs. Innovation and learning, everything to do with your human resources. Um, and, you know, in a company, you will have the, the mid-level manager, the process managers are typically there, getting these KPIs. This is what we need to improve, and these are our targets. For example, it might be that we have been losing to our competitors. Uh, many customers are leaving. We call that churning. And I have lost 10% of customers in the past year. So that's something that will trigger the upper management to say, we need to improve our customer loyalty by 10, by 10 which means the number of returning customers we get should increase by 10%. Um, that means that people are coming back more to consume our services. You as a process manager, you are the owner of the um, a order to cash process, uh, and you try to decompose that, and you try to figure out why are customers not returning. You might run some questionnaires, or you might look at the data, 
to figure that out, and you determine that, look, it's really timely service that we are not delivering. So let me set as an objective for the order to cash process to improve the timely delivery. Then you look into you know, frameworks for identifying performance measures, including the different concepts I just introduced to you. And you say, well, probably I want to make sure that my customers get served below the time that they consider normal. Let's say I am a restaurant. And my customers would like to be served in less than 30 minutes to say something, or in less than 20 minutes. So what I am going to care about, I'm going to care about the percentage of customers who get served in more than 30 minutes, or vice versa, those who get served in less than 30 minutes. And I want to make sure, I'm going to call that the on-time delivery rate or the on-time service rate. And I'm going to try to make sure that that on-time service rate is as close as possible to 100%. So using the data I have, or maybe using a little bit with the help of little slow, I will come up with um, the current situation. And I will tell you, currently, we are serving 80% of our customers on time and 20% late. And I need to increase that to 90%. So I will set as a goal that next year, by the end of 2021, we need to have increased the on-time service rate to 90%. That becomes a mandate, and that then triggers a bunch of process improvement initiatives to try to achieve this target. And that is where um, a process mining comes on board. I'm going to look at the data using process mining techniques to figure out what can I do to improve my on-time delivery. You don't need to invent performance measures when you are in an organization and depending on the type of organization. There are books, sometimes of 300 pages. One of them is called the score reference model or the APQC process classification framework or the IT infrastructure library, which will define heaps of processes. And for every process, they will define different performance measures. So you can go to these books and scour through them and find out what temporal measures, what cost measures, and what quality measures should you be looking for each type of process. We won't be looking at them. It's just a reference to say, well, in this course, we're going to be working with a small number of performance measures, but the world of performance measurement is much broader. So that's what I have to say about performance measurement. Let me talk to you, step up a little bit, and say, fine, Marlon. I can measure my process. You know, I can define certain measures and I can define in a way that is guided by the KPIs that are coming from the upper management, all fine. So how can I then visualize how well I am performing with respect to a measure? And maybe more than that, how can I visualize the possible reasons why I am not performing as well as I should? So, um, and this brings me to the topic of business process performance monitoring. Uh, business process monitoring is a, a set of activities in the field of business process management that have to do with monitoring my process. And in this field, there are two categories of techniques and also two categories of tools out there that take as input data from the enterprise systems of the organization, package them in the form of so-called event streams or event logs, and discover a bunch of visualizations to allow me to understand how I am performing and why I am performing this way. Um, and there are two categories of techniques. One of them is performance dashboards, which is what I'm going to briefly talk to you today. And the other one is process mining. And the rest of the course from next week onwards will go into process mining. But before we jump into process mining, I want to make you aware of, a, of, the, of this adjacent field called performance dashboards, because they are very much connected, as you will see. You know, performance dashboards allows me to visualize the performance per se. Process mining allows me to dig deeper and determine why the performance is the way. 
Performance dashboards are visualizations consisting of different elements that I will enumerate uh, a little bit later, uh, and that are meant to help someone in the organization, typically a manager to, or a worker, to improve their work. And it's very important when designing perform performance dashboards to know which type of stakeholder will be viewing. Don't design a visualization if you do not know who is going to see it. The first thing that the ABC in performance dashboards, in the field of performance dashboard design, is to, before you design a dashboard, to determine if it is a so-called operational dashboard, a tactical dashboard, and a strategic dashboard. If you make the decision up front, the discussions in the team that is going to design the dashboard are going to be greatly simplified. And let me define these three levels. An operational dashboard is a dashboard that is targeted at the workers who are doing the process. Let's say I have a process for a, a, the order to delivery process at an online shop that sells electronic appliances. Uh, an operational dashboard will be a dashboard for the people in the packaging in the warehouse who can see you know, how many orders they have to package of different types and that they use to organize their daily work. An operational dashboard is usually a runtime dashboard. You want to see now, you want it to refresh it almost in real time or in near real time because your workers will use it to decide what to do in the next few minutes or what to do in the next hour. The emphasis of operational dashboards is so-called detect and respond. And the typical performance measures that you will display in that dashboard are working process, the week, for different categories of work, uh, problematic cases. How many cases do you have that are at risk of being late? Or the resource load. How much your different people in your packaging department are busy? How much the different teams in the department are busy? Or how much your robots in the warehouse are busy? Um, there are tools that will allow you to gather data about the execution of the process and produce a bunch of these performance dashboards and give you some visualizations. I will talk about some of the tools in a minute. The second type of dashboards are tactical dashboards. Tactical dashboards are not destined to the people who are doing the work or the direct supervisors. They are destined, they are targeted at process owners, process managers who want to improve the process. Their questions are different. They want to say like, okay, let me look at how well I perform in this process in January this year versus January of last year. Am I performing better this year than I did last year? Uh, what, in what areas I am improving, in what areas I am becoming worse, in which areas my, my quality is stable. Um, so they want to see, they want to answer questions about sources of cost, where, where am I spending money? Um, bottlenecks, where am I spending time in the process? Why is my process so slow? Uh, error rates, you know, in which areas do I have more defects? Resource utilization, am I using my resource efficiently? So those are the types of things that they will ask to you uh, in, in these dashboards. Um, and they are used, these dashboards are used by managers of the process who want to make decisions about, for example, how do I improve the process in March or in April? Or how do I make sure that by September of this year, like in five months time, I will have a better process running about? Um, tactical dashboards will display things like, for example, the distribution of cycle times so that I can notice, hey, there's a bunch of cases here that are taking too long. Or they sometimes display um, a, a things like um, a, the performance of my process in different geographic regions. Hey, I'm doing very well in this region, but I'm doing very poorly. I have a high defect rate of a certain type in another region. Um, that's the kind of questions that tactical dashboards answer. Finally, strategic dashboards are meant for the upper management, the executive managers, etc. 
In this course, we are not going to be doing dealing with strategic dashboards, but it's important to know these things exist as well. Uh, strategic dashboards are the dashboards that executives use in terms of to answer high level questions, like, for example, how is my customer, how am I doing in terms of customer loyalty? How am I doing in terms of a, a timeliness? Uh, how am I doing in terms of cost? Uh, am I containing costs? Are my costs increasing? How am I doing in terms of sustainability targets, you know, uh, CO2 emissions or stuff like that? Um, and the way these are designed is by identifying a number of performance areas, high level, like customer satisfaction, customer complaints, management, customer feedback, um, uh, timeliness, etc. And then for different process groups, determining which, which measures make sense for which groups of processes. And we talked about groups of processes briefly last week, you know, so, so how well am I doing in terms of timeliness in my repair processes? I'm well, how well am I doing in my delivery processes, uh, etc. cetera. And, and the way they do it, although we are not going to enter into details, is by defining for every performance area like the high level process performance areas, like um, people, financial performance, customer excellence performance, and refining it hierarchically until they get to performance measures that can be measured with data extracted by the underlying systems. Okay. Um, I have introduced this distinction between operational dashboards, tactical dashboards, and strategic dashboards. As I have said in this course, we will not deal with strategic dashboard. You will find them if you ever take a course about strategic management, and then they will talk to you about balance scorecards and related methods. In this course, we will focus on tactical dashboards mainly, and to some extent on operational dashboards. Before closing today, let me briefly brush through that through a, a very important question, which is like, how do I design a dashboard? Say a tactical dashboard. You know, I have a user. What do I, I, I know I need to do a tactical dashboard. How do I determine what to put in that dashboard? And I offer you here a five step method to go through that question um, that starts naturally by identifying your target the user to whom you are going to display this dashboard, and then figuring out via interviews what kind of questions they want to answer using this dashboard. And then what do they want to figure out out of that? And then based on that, you will identify what dashboard elements do you need in order to answer this question. In a typical dashboard, you will have different types of elements. I offer you a classification of five different types of elements that you will find a dashboard. Indicators, which are like rectangles that display a performance measure. A trend charts, which tells you how does a performance measure evolve over time. For example, but how much my working process has evolved over time. Like in December, I had a lot. In January, I had less. In February, I had less. But in March, it picked up. You know, the number of active cases picked up. So that is called a trend short. Um, I will also in a dashboard have performance distribution shots. Uh, for example, uh, this, um, this, this graph, this, this charting here is displaying me my performance per country, per, per state in a country. So I'm, dis I'm, I'm, I'm displaying a performance measure cross-sectionally uh, across different sections of my organization. So that's, that's what we call um, a performance distribution chart. Uh, sorry, a performance distribution chart is more like, what is the, the, the histogram? What is the distribution of my cycle times? Are my cycle times usually all low? Or do I have a long tail of cases that take a long time? So let me show you one of them. Will be the one that is shown here at the bottom is the distribution of that cycle time of the cases in my process over time. And I see that most cases are somewhere in the middle, you know, are taking about five days. And so lots of cases are taking less. And very few cases are taking more. 
that's kind of very healthy. I'm doing pretty well in terms of cycle time. Most cases, okay, this amount, some take less, and very, very few take more. Uh, a cross-sectional chart would be one like this one. You take a dimension, for example, the location, the geography, the business unit, the type of product, the type of customer, and you display a performance measure for each group defined by this dimension that you have picked up. So for example, here, I'm displaying a performance measure for every state in a country. Um, and then we, uh, once you have picked the type of elements you want in your dashboard, like I'm gonna put some performance indicators, some trend charts, some distribution charts, some cross-sectional charts, you then determine for every type of chart, what do you display in the x-axis? That's also called an independent variable. And what do you display on the y-axis, also known as the dependent variable? In the y-axis, you would typically put a performance measure. And in the x-axis, you will put either time or you will put like different countries or different business units or different stores or different types of products, etc. Um, there are many tools for um, uh, creating process performance dashboards out of execution data coming from a business process. Um, a big category of tool in there is called business activity monitoring. These are very good for building operational dashboards. Um, you know, Oracle has a product in space, SAP has a product in space, Vitria has a product in space, et cetera. And then there are a bunch of tools for building more tactical dashboards. Very often in companies, people are using uh, business intelligence tools, like for example, Microsoft Power BI or ClickView or Tableau to build tactical dashboards. But you can also do it inside a process finding tool that we will introduce in this course. Uh, there are dashboard modules that also allow you to do some of these tactical dashboards that we will be talking about. And separately, there are tools for building dashboards at the strategic level, also called balanced set scorecard tools that I'm not gonna be covering in this course. Before I close, let me just make this a little bit more concrete by showing you how it works in an actual tool. Um, I need to um, uh, stop sharing. Uh, maybe I need to unplug myself from here. Hopefully it's not gonna cause a problem. Come back here. Uh, stop sharing the screen and uh, I'm going to share my screen number one uh, screen and I'm going to bring up a, my browser and try to show you quickly how one of these dashboards will look in reality. So um, this is a tool that I will start to introduce to you uh, starting from next week and onwards. There's no need for you to, to use it right now. Uh, it's called a Promore. And in here, you can um, connect this to an enterprise system or manually upload data. And for example, here I have a, a data set from um, a repair process, like a process where people call in and say like, my laptop is not working or my audiovisual equipment is not working. Uh, and then somebody comes and tries to fix it. Um, and uh, I can, that contains all the data of this process that has happened in the past, uh, say, uh, a, a three months of data. And from there, using a process mining tool, I can build certain dashboards that tells me as a tactical manager, as a process owner, give me some information about the process. And in here, you will see that there are indicators at the top, like the number of cases that occurred during this time period, the number of events, uh, like how many, how much activity there was, um, the case duration, which is an, another name for the cycle time, um, a, et cetera, et cetera. I can see how much, for example, what was the distribution of active cases over time. I can see where my peaks of work uh, happened in January, less uh, on the 12th of January, less of them on the 5th of January, and less of them in 19th of January. So I can see how the distribution of, of cases takes place over time 
This is what we call a trend chart, also known as a longitudinal chart. And uh, this is more of a distribution chart. It tells me the distributions of case durations over time. And I can see that, you know, it's more or less following a normal distribution, uh, et cetera. Uh, and I have also some detailed tables that gives me more detailed statistics about it. I have also some cross-sectional charts in here, like for example, the amount of time that different activities in my process are taking. This is cross-sectional because I'm visualizing the performance across different uh, categories, in this case, activities uh, uh, within my process. Um, and we will see that any a tactical dashboarding tool like this one uh, will allow you to uh, compose your own chart, add new your own dashboard, add new charts into it, new indicators, new tables, um, and for example, select what do you want to display in the x-axis. For example, I might want to uh, show the distribution of cases, how many cases there are for every type of defect that I need to repair, or how many cases there are uh, for every uh, person involved in my process. How many cases does tester one, tester two, tester three, or sober one or sober two get? We're gonna come back to this topic of uh, customizing performance dashboards uh, in week number, in the lesson number five, when we talk about a topic called performance mining, where we're going to use process mining tools in order to analyze uh, the performance of the process.